welcome to the channel. I'm Alpha Heavy Gamer. I hope you enjoyed the intro showcasing the Republic of Korea Armed Forces. And they looked ready because they are ready. I think this nation is ready to be in War Thunder. It is a highly capable and modernized military force with a total active personnel of over 600,000. It ranks as one of the largest standing armies in the world. The ROC Navy, ROC Air Force, the ROC Army are equipped with some of the latest technology and we're going to talk about that today. I'm going to go through, um, you know, speculate a bit, but I'm going to go through some of the tech trees. I think this, um, like I said, is ready to be in the game as an independent tech tree. Uh, I'm not including any North Korean forces. I'm just going to talk about the core Republic of Korea armed forces today. All right, so let's jump in. So the rock, that's what I'm going to call them instead of the whole thing, Republic of Korea armed forces. But ROC forces are charged with defending South Korea from the North Korean military. And, um, you know, that's kind of why I'm not going to include their equipment and the rundown I'm going to give you. Um, but if you didn't know, South Korea has a robust defense industry. Um, their aerospace sector is very, very vibrant. They have indigenously developed some quite impressive weapon systems. I mean, um, of course, they have they kind of have an obvious issue to the north of the DMZ. All right, so I'm going to start with the Air Force first, and I'm going to kind of go through um, some of the equipment that they have right now. Um, top to bottom, Lockheed Martin F-35A. You know, we all know this is a multi-role, fifth-generation stealth fighter, Acer radar, internal weapons bays, external weapon stations. Um, you know, I kind of don't need to go through it all because I, I believe this aircraft is a ways off in War Thunder. Um, but as a top ranking aircraft, I think it would be something to look forward to, something to strive for when we eventually get to, you know, whatever this is going to be, BR 13 or 14 or 15, who knows? So, yeah, you know, the F-35, when it comes, um, it'll come for several nations in the game. There are a lot of uh, countries that have bought that. So I won't talk much about that one. But what I do want to talk about is the Korean Aerospace Industries KF-21 Boramay. Now this comes um, is going to be in two blocks. There's only block one right now, the air superiority block, and there's going to be a block two follow on, which is multi-role. So the, the Boramay is a next generation fighter jet developed by South Korean Defense Industries with the aim of replacing the aging fleet of F-4s and F-5s in the country's Air Force. So what would this jet bring to War Thunder? Well, it's going to feature canard delta wing configuration, two jet engines, up to 1.8 Mach. It's going to be highly maneuverable, has an ASA radar, can carry a range of weapons, um, you know, air to ground, air to air, bombs, internal gun. Um, like I said, it has that ASA radar. It has a helmet mounted display. It's not designed to be a stealth fighter outright. I mean, it is fifth gen, but it's not stealth, but it is stealthier than many fourth generation fighters, um, mostly because the Borame does not carry weapons in internal bays like fifth gen fighters. It carries them externally. And that's fine by me because this jet has 10 hard points. So um, yeah, I mean, especially in the block one air superiority configuration, that's a lot of air to air missiles you're going to be able to carry. So I can't wait to see this jet in the game. All right, another jet that's going to come with the uh, the Rock Air Force is the FA-50. And, you know, the FA-50 comes in two blocks, a block 10 and a block 20. Uh, this is another Korean aerospace industries development, another indigenous fighter. It's a light combat aircraft. And this uh, fighter attack version was developed from the trainer, advanced trainer version, which is the T-50 Golden Eagle or TA-50. So um, this thing was designed to replace the aging F-5Es and Fs and, and even the A-37 attack aircraft. So the F-A-50 strengthens the defense of the ROC um, Air Force. You know, it's a think about it as a cheaper option to the F-15s I'll talk about and to their F-16s and to the KF-21. So, you know, like kind of like a cheap attack aircraft that also has the ability to do some air to air. This is a multi-role jet fighter. But when I say cheap, that doesn't mean this is lacking in capability. So, um, like I said, it can perform a range of missions, um, air to air, air to ground, close air support, reconnaissance. Uh, you can carry all kinds of smart weapons on this thing. It has an internal 20 millimeter gun as well. It has advanced avionics and radar systems. 
um, one version can be equipped with an ASA radar. You know, this thing can also carry um, like advanced missiles like the AMRAMs. So overall, a feisty little jet that I love to get my hands on, you know, eventually when it comes to the game. But it's going to be pretty cool. All right, so next up with the heavy hitters is the uh, Korean KF-16. There, It comes in a C version and a D version. The block is 52. Korea has also purchased the KF-16V, the Viper, so the newest um, top-line Viper, um, and that's to come. But if you did know, Korea um, licensed builds their own F-16s. You know, they got thousands of new components. It's still a multi-role fighter, the KF-16. It, uh, it retains all those air-to-ground and air-to-air -air capabilities locally produced by Korean Aerospace Industries. They built a total of 140 of these. So, you know, lots in service. Um, and like I said, it's based on the F-16C um, Block 52 aircraft. And so like Block 52s, you know, it carries um, the AMRAM, probably the AM-9X, although I'm not sure of that. Uh, Maverick missiles, anti-ship missiles, JDAMs, it, you know, retains its cannon. Everything's the same. Uh, the radar is an APG-68 version 7 multi-mode radar, so a pretty advanced set. Um, you know, standard chaff flare dispenser, and, you know, it also has a jamming system. So the Korean F-16C Block 52 is going to be pretty good playing to have in a game. And then eventually, you know, they'll get the range-topping KF-16V just known as the Viper uh, Block 7072. So Korea would eventually have two F-16s in the game, that one um, at the top being the KF-16V. All right, so the next aircraft is pretty exciting. That's the F-15K Slam Eagle. It's a multi-role fighter designed for the ROC Air Force, and it's, a, it's really an advanced variant of the F-15E Strike Eagle. Uh, it can conduct long-range precision strike missions during day or night in all weather conditions. You know, it's equipped with state-of-the-art mission equipment, um, you know, air-to-ground, air-to-air, air-to-sea missions. So this jet has it all, you know, capable of Mach 2 Plus, um, can do any mission in any weather conditions, equipped with an APG-63 Acer radar. And if you're wondering why they call it the, uh, the Slam Eagle, it's equipped with the Slammer or the Standoff Land Attack Missile Expanded Response, so the AGM-84 Slammer. And that's, you know, really what it gets its name from. Okay, so those were some of the top-end goodies that would be coming for, for a rock aviation tree. There are also uh, a lot of older aircraft. The Rock Air Force flew the F-4D. They're still flying the F-4E, you know, at least until later on this year. So if you want to see one, you might want to hop over there. You know, they, um, they also operated the F-5 and A and B and E and F variants. They also had their own license built versions of the F5, the KF5 ENF. All right next up is the uh, K1, which is a another indigenously developed aircraft by uh, Korean Aerospace Industries. It's a light attack aircraft with modern turboprop with a glass cockpit. You know, um, equipped for it could be equipped for counterinsurgency missions or a forward air controller mission. You know, carries rockets, some bombs, and some sidewinders for self defense. So a nice plane to have into the game, um, it be an indigenously developed aircraft. So that's always good. Kind of looks like a Super Takano to me, um, but it'd be pretty cool. Next aircraft is um, the venerable A-37, you know, a, a two seat round attack aircraft. Um, pretty, pretty obsolete by now, but um, it'd be cool to see in the game. There is no A-37 in the game right now. So, you know, if the Korean tech tree got it, that'd be pretty nice. There's also the F-86D, you know, we all know about the F-86, and Korea also flew the F-51D Mustang. So that's the, the roundup of aircraft. There's probably some I missed here, you know, if you guys know about any, please bring it up. But, you know, this tech tree probably wouldn't start off at rank one, probably maybe rank two or even three, you know, because of the, uh, the small amount of aircraft, but highly capable aircraft. All right, so if you're only interested in land forces, this is going to be your section right here. So the Rock Army is going to pack a mean punch in War Thunder. So let's jump into their MBT. So the K-1, the K-1E-1, and the K-1E-2. So these tanks designed by Hyundai, you know, with help from General Dynamics, you know, they drew heavily um, from the M1 Abrams and the, um, and the XM1 prototype. These tanks all use a 105 millimeter gun, but 
they are the backbone of the Rock Army's armored core. So this tank, um, the K-1, entered service in the late 1980s. Um, it's undergone so many uh, upgrades and enhancements since then. So for armored protection, the K-1 is very well protected and incorporates advanced composite modular armor, um, which is pretty effective against the threats it's expected to face, mainly the North Korean military. You know, there's built-in spall liners and like I said, modular add-on armor for enhanced survivability. I talked about the firepower already. You know, it, it features that 105 millimeter rifle gun. Um, like I said, it, it, it is adequate for the threat that it faces, which is primarily the North Korean military. So this tank is manned by four crew members like the M1 Abrams, you know, so no automatic loader here. It features, uh, you know, a lot of the um, both digital ballistic computer, laser range finding, night vision capabilities, um, all those advanced systems that you would find on contemporary tanks, it has that. So really good advanced fire control systems. But for mobility, Hyundai decided to take the K-1 in a different direction than the M1 Abrams. So the K-1 uses a turbocharged diesel engine um, rather than a turbine engine, which provides uh, sufficient power for, for the tank and uh, it gives it a high degree of mobility and maneuverability. So there were some significant upgrades to the K-1, the K-1E1. The upgrade, uh, it's similar to, and I haven't talked about it yet, but it's similar to the K-1A2 upgrade. You know, it still retains the 105 millimeter gun. And then there's the K1E2, which um, incorporates a radar warning system, some new armor, and it still retains the 105 millimeter gun. All right, so that's three tanks right there. Now let's talk about the next three in the series, and that's the K1A1, the K1A2, and the K1A2 PIP. And although the uh, K1A1 looks very similar to the K1, it is a completely different tank with new systems and better protection. The K1A1 also is a completely indigenous upgrade. They didn't get any help from General Dynamics like they did with the K1. Now the K1A1 is very similar in capability to the M1A1, you know, across firepower, armor protection, fire control, mobility. So I won't go into the, uh, the, the detail details here. Except to say that the uh, that these series of upgrades did finally get the 120 millimeter gun. So after the A1 was the A2, of course, that tank benefited a lot from the K2 Black Panther uh, development. So that the A2 features a lot of equipment from the K2 Black Panther. So that was a major upgrade uh, to the to the tank. The K1A2 also the K1A2 PIP added a soft kill APS system. So, you know, the ultimate here, the K1A2, very uh, capable vehicle, vastly different from the K1 series in terms of capability. All right, so let's talk about the K2 Black Panther because this is probably what you all will be grinding for on the ground side of things. So the K2 was the first fully indigenous design. Learned, um, they learned a lot of lessons from the K1. It was considered, uh, it is considered to be the equal to or better than an M1A2 Abrams. It, it weighs less than an A2 Abrams. And it has some highly sophisticated systems, so let's jump into that. Okay, so this is dubbed as the world's first fourth generation tank. Um, the K2 is a state-of-the-art main battle tank developed by Hyundai. It's the primary main battle tank of the Rock Army, and it is recognized as one of the most advanced tanks in the world right now. You might have heard that um, that Poland is buying some K2s, you know, so it's it's definitely get out in the world. This tank was designed to replace the, you know, we just been talking about it, the K1 series of MBTs. So the K2 features some pretty advanced armor protection. Of course, you know, we're not going to really know the composition of the armor it has because that stuff doesn't get released. And, you know, and we're definitely not doing this stuff on this channel and you guys know what I'm talking about. So it incorporates advanced composite and uh, modular armor. Uh, you can also bolt on some explosive reactive armor. So you got some exceptional protection right here against ATGMs and other kinetic rounds. Um, the tank features a active protection system which enhances its survivability. It's equipped with a radar warning receiver, a laser warning receiver, um, you know, it can detect incoming uh, radar and and laser homing missiles that are aimed at the tank you know and it turns the turret 
into the direction of the threat, you know, and shoots off some multi-spectral uh, screening grenades. So a you know, soft kill system, not hard kill, but uh, it's still pretty good. And of course, those grenades, those multi-spectral grenades hide the tank from the Mark One eyeball, from um, FLIR systems, forward-looking infrared, from millimeter wave optics uh, and radar. Uh, basically, nothing should be able to lock onto the tank. It also has a missile warning receiver that's on the uh, the turret that's able to uh, to cover a total of 180 degrees. The missile warning receiver also has a 60 degree uh, at high angle lookup, so it's capable of detecting you know helicopter fired ATGMs, um, and it's also capable of detecting wire guided ATGMs which don't emit anything. So the system is built to um, incorporate future upgrades. Uh, a hard kill APS system is planned for the future. The tank is armed with a 120 millimeter smoothbore gun and it fires a range of ammunition. It also has a KTAM round, which is a top attack smart munition, which could be pretty strong for the game. I'd love to see that come in. Uh, but this tank, it differs also in the way that the ammunition is loaded. So it has an auto loader. So they have lost the fourth crew member K2 is an auto-loading tank. All right, as far as fire control systems, the K2s, um, like I said, it was pretty advanced there. It features a hunter-killer capability, which we're all familiar with by now, um, but there's a lot of other stuff that's pretty unique. It uses an extremely high-frequency radar system, a, um, an advanced laser rangefinder, a crosswind sensor, uh, so it's capable of something called lock-on targeting. This means the tank can acquire um, and track targets using a, a thermographic camera at a range of about six miles. So that's a heck of a capability there. For comparison, I believe a British Challenger in Desert Storm still holds the world record for the longest range tank shot and tank kill, which was 5,100 meters and that's about three miles. So um, that's six miles is a long way. All right, so the K2 is no slouch in the mobility department either. It has a 1,500 horsepower diesel engine. It also incorporates a very advanced suspension system. If you didn't know, South Korea features uh, some pretty mountainous terrain, so it's able to get into some really good firing positions. There's also one more version of the K2, uh, the K2ME, which features the Trophy Active Protection System and even more armor. Of course, there's the K2PL, which is going to be exported to Poland. So as far as um, rounding out and filling out the tree, though, so South Korea did use the, um, you know, the M4 Sherman, the A3E8, the M36 tank destroyer, M24 Chaffee, the M47. They were a very uh, heavy user of the M48. So there's at least four or five M48s, uh, the M8 Greyhound, the Terran T6, uh, the T72 M1. There's also the T80U. Uh, if you didn't know, uh, Russia owes some money to South Korea and instead of giving them cash, I guess they give the South Korean military, uh, they give it to them in form of military vehicles. So South Korea has about 30 or so T-80s, which is pretty weird, but I guess kind of cool. So rounding out the ground forces, infantry fighting vehicles, there's the K-21, which is a pretty new South Korean armored uh, infantry vehicle. It features a 40 millimeter automatic cannon it's um you know it's also got ATGM so a pretty pretty new um, modern IFV which should be pretty effective in the game. It includes an active protection suite. It has a hard kill any um you know hard kill any missile system, and um you know it can you can add more armor to it. it has modular armor packages. And similar to the T80 situation, South Korea also has BMP3s in its inventory as a Russia also paid them in BMP3s. Uh, there's some other infantry fighting vehicles with like machine guns. I'm not going to really talk about those. As far as um, air defense though, so SPAGs, uh, there's a K263A1 Chungnung 20 millimeter gun. So, you know, a Vulcan on an M113 or something like that. Uh, so there's that. So there is another air defense system, the K30BHO, which uh, combines two 30 millimeter auto cannons with uh, surface-to-air missiles, the Raybolt or the Chiron, you know, kind of more Shored, but another system nonetheless. There's also the KSAM Chunma, 
which is a crow towel. It's referred to as also the also as the KSAM Pegasus. So it's a you know a medium range missile, which is going to give the tech tree you know some degree of protection from uh, close air support. All right, so for helicopters, for all you heli fans, there um, are a lot of Cobras, the AH-1F, J and S. There's also an advanced version of the Apache, the AH-64E Guardian. There's the MD-500, there's the AH-6, there's a BO-105, and there's also an indigenously developed uh, LH, LAH EC-155 helicopter by Korean Aerospace Industries. So, you know, a, a helicopter tech tree that's pretty filled in. I think that's a, a good addition, you know, um, to um, complement your ground lineups. All right, so to the two Naval fans out there, I'm going to talk about Naval real quick here just because I didn't want to leave it out because I'm talking about adding an entire nation to the game. So as far as um, Naval, I think uh, the Naval component has the potential to be pretty significant for South Korea in the game. There are a lot of Cold War ships. There are not a, a lot of modern ships. There are a lot of um, minor surface combatants like patrol boats and corvettes. I'm not going to talk about every single ship here. I'm kind of just going to list them. But um, you can see starting off here, the Chung Mu destroyer is a former Fletcher class. You know, so it's um, it's pretty significant in the amount of ships that are here. I didn't expect to find that many for a uh, South Korean naval. And then when we start talking about modern destroyers, you know, there are a lot of Arleigh Burke uh, type modern destroyers here and some um, some indigenous uh, frigates that are also here. So I'm just going to list them here and you can check them out if you like. But um, I think and there's also some submarines that I'm not even talking about. So there's a there is a full um, spectrum of capabilities when it comes to naval for the South Korean Navy in the game. So I think it would be really worthwhile to add. So ending out here um, for the tech tree, like I said in the beginning, I don't want to add the North Korean um, equipment to this. I just don't think that's a good idea. I want this to be an independent tech tree. Um, there may need to be, um, there's a degree of copy paste for sure, especially when you come to the older equipment, but there are a lot of newer um, vehicles, a lot of indigenous designs that I think will be pretty interesting. And just, you know, it's so much content. I don't know why Gaijin would want to leave this out of the game. Somehow, some way it needs to come in, especially when we're talking about aircraft, especially when we're talking about the, uh, the main battle tanks. Well, let me know what you think. Do you think this is an entire waste? It's going to be like another Israel. You don't want to see it. You don't care. Or are you like me and you're always looking to add some new content um, and you would like to see this in the game. Like I said, some of the uh, trees may need to start out at rank two, maybe even rank three. Um, you may just have to accept the thinness um, of the trees. I probably didn't find every vehicle either. Um, there's, there's, of course, there are people out there that, um, that probably have lots more information and can fill in some of the missing stuff. But anyway, I'm, I'm babbling on here. Thank you guys. If you made it to the end for watching the entire video, I really enjoy talking about this stuff and let me know what you think in the comments about a independent South Korean tech tree in the game. All right, guys, I'll see you in my next video. Peace.